Okay, great. I think I'm in two places here. I think you are. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. It is our third time coming together as the Leadership Academy and I'm really excited today because we have a special guest speaker, my mentor, coach, friend, Kevin Hall, who has had um, a few opportunities to speak with us in the past. And um, I'm really excited that you could take some time out of your busy schedule to, to join me today, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's my privilege and honor always. How are you? I am well. I am doing And Sherry fine. is good? Everybody's good. Yes. Good. That's great. So, um, Kevin, I know that we have had you speak on a few different occasions for us, and many people know you um, as the author of Aspire, and you have worked with Stephen Covey and other really dynamic CEOs and thought leaders across the, the planet, um, and you're working on some new projects right now, am I correct? We are. We are. Some new written works as well as a new Pathfinder leadership training course that, that discusses the different levels of pathfinding from a level one where you begin to a level two where you start to see that there's more to a level three um, where there is more and, yes. and you stop learning. And so that's what brought me to want to include you in this conversation on the Leadership Academy this month, because I, I really have learned a lot from you about this whole concept of being a pathfinder. And, and you know, the, the purpose of this group is to pull apart leadership concepts, to teach, to inspire, and to pop the lid off of our own leadership capability and to grow more as leaders. And so I'm excited to turn this over to you where you can teach us. I'm going to encourage everyone to take notes. We'll have some time for you to ask questions um, before uh, we're done uh, at 2 p.m. today. And um, so, Kevin, I'm going to turn this to you. And thank you again. Thank you, Anna. Um, I just, I am so grateful for our friendship. I have immense admiration uh, for you. And to have this Leadership Academy, um, this is a, this is going to be a fun experience for everyone here. This is your third right of the year we did january. yeah we just kicked this off on january in january so this is our third time coming together as a group great well let's start in that this is leadership academy let's break down that word leader if we can lea means path and der means finder so a leader is literally a pathfinder and if you were to go back um, in ancient days when the pathfinder, the leader who could sustain life with using their senses, who could see and hear and sense where what was going to sustain life was going, they became the leader. It wasn't the person with the most seniority. It wasn't the person with the biggest uh, tribal headdress or the biggest teepee. It was the person who knew where the game was going. That's what would sustain life. And when that hunting party went out, they would tap into their senses. So one of the things that I would begin with is, is your senses. The more senses that you get involved with a goal, a dream, an aspiration, the greater the likelihood of achieving that. We have five senses for a reason. And Anna, you just heard from one of my best friends, Peter Vidmar, as he talked about a champion's mindset, how important it is to emotionalize those things that we want. And so I want you to think about what would be the difference between a pathfinder who's maybe beginning on level one and a pathfinder who's at level three, who's starting to master what it really means to be an effective pathfinder. Um, and we're going to talk here for a minute, and then I want to open it up for a couple of questions. Maybe we'll go here for 10 or 15 minutes, Anna, like you said. And then you can always come in and, and share a thought, put your hand up if there's anything. Uh, by the way, Susan, I love those sunflowers behind you in the backdrop. That is in the seven affirmations, we have wisdom from nature and the sunflower 
is wisdoms from nature because of how resilient they are. You can drop a seed in rocky terrain without much water, with just a little bit of sun, and it's going to come up, up under, through, and around anything that comes in its way. Let's come back and see how that relates to being a pathfinder. When we start sometimes in leadership or management, we think it's about managing things. And you do have things that you've got to take care of. And sometimes it's like, who gets the most done? Who has the biggest list? I've got to get all of this done. And so we get caught up in the thick of thin things. And there isn't anybody on this call today that doesn't have more to do than maybe you feel like you have time on this Monday, March 14th to get done. But as you move up as a leader, we start to realize that it isn't just taking care of things that matter, it's taking care of people. And there's a big distance, uh, distinction, a dynastic distinction between a level one pathfinder and a level three pathfinder. When we get involved in the tyranny of the urgent and the trivial, and we all get it, we, we realize, boy, we're spending so much time, maybe too much time on what is urgent and what is trivial and not enough time on what is important. A level two pathfinder, they spend a little bit more time on what is important and a level three pathfinder spends more time on what is truly meaningful and significant. So let's just share a couple of differences here. Often when we're, you, you'll see a leader at times come in and say, here I am, right? Walk into a room, here I am, I'm the leader, I've got the title, this is what we're supposed to do, here I am. And that's a, that's a good place to start but again, when you get to that level three, a level three pathfinder says, there you are. They get on an experience like this. They see Liz. They see Gretchen. They see Susan squared. We've got a couple of Susans. They see Aaron and Rita. And they, they, they come on and they say, there you are. And you've all had leaders like that. Here I am versus there you are. And there's a point where our mentality shifts, you know, from handling these things, from getting and having to a state of being. And when you're around a level three pathfinder, we always say, what do you want to be, do, and have? And sometimes we get that backwards. Well, I got to have it before I can do it, before I can be it. And when you come in and focus on those you're leading, that's when a shift really takes place. Sometimes we say, well, I've got I've to prioritize my schedule. I've got to take my schedule. I've got to get it. I've got to put it all down. I've got to take care of all of these things again. That's some of the getting, the having, and even at level two, the doing. But at level three, we move from you know, putting our prioritized pri scheduling um, just, just things to we're going to schedule our priorities. You don't want to just prioritize what's on your schedule. You want to schedule your priorities. And that's a huge difference. And I would say for a level three pathfinder, one of the keys is scheduling time with your people, your key people to make sure that they know that they're key, to make sure that they're affirmed and listened to. Sometimes as a leader, all you need to do is just listen, believe, and inspire. And that those last two, Stephen Covey would tell you, John Maxwell would tell you, and I'll tell you that the number one responsibility for a level three leader, a level three pathfinder, is to inspire to breathe life, spire means breath, to breathe life into others of their dreams. That's the number one thing, to say, I believe in you. I believe that you can do this. That is so critical. And so as you start a day, 
think of as a leader, who can I breathe life in to today? Who can I add value to today? Who can I edify and encourage and believe in today? That is the greatest responsibility that we'll have as a leader. And again, this is a shift. You need to start somewhere, but instead of starting with things, what are the things I've got to take care of today? Who are the people that I can support and encourage and compliment today? And Anna and I were talking earlier this morning, for me, um, I'm in St. George, Utah, just outside of Zion National Park, so it's still morning here, and it's good afternoon in, in Hudson Valley, New York, but we have this opportunity when we look at, okay, who, what am I grateful for? We were talking about gratitude. And when you think of great leaders, I think of two things. They're growing, they're learning, they're growing. When, when we become a master, we never stop learning. A master never stops learning. Stephen Covey, up to the day he died, was speed reading or scanning a book every day of his life. I mean, he was a speed reader, not that he spent two or three hours on a book every day, but he was growing. And John Maxwell has taught me that growth doesn't just lead to happiness. He took my wife, Sherry, and I to dinner after someone gave him a copy of Aspire, and he reached out to me, and he modeled what it means to just compliment someone just to tell someone, you know what, what you're doing is important and being grateful for that. The second key, I think, for great um, level three pathfinders is they're grateful. They not only grow, but they're grateful. And Anna, you've heard this as you came out to our Genshai Life Mastery Train. It was so fun to have you and Rosemary and your two daughters join us in January. There's an affirmative law for being grateful. The affirmation is, I am grateful. And the affirmative law is just three words. Gratitude garners greatness. If there was a guild of greatness, it would be understanding our giftedness, having gratitude and expressing gratitude, and then being generous or abundant. Those are also keys. If I'm looking for someone to be in my five, we're the average, Jim Rohn said, of the five people we spend the most time with. I want to know, are they generous or abundant? Are they grateful? And do they understand the gifts that they've been gifted with? Gratitude comes, comes from the word grace, and grace means divine gift. When we open our gifts and serve others with those gifts, amazing things start to happen. So let's just go back to this shift, and we're going to open it up for a couple of thoughts or ideas or questions from any of you on this call. You probably heard me share this before, but if not, I'll share it again. Our gifts, your gifts aren't about you. Your purpose isn't about you. Leadership, if you really look at it, isn't about you. It's about serving those who need your gifts, who need your purpose, who need your leadership. And they say one of the best ways to discover your purpose is find somebody to serve and then go serve them. When you find someone to serve, to believe in, to inspire, to light the path of someone else. It's been said that he or she who holds a lantern to light the pathway of their brother or sister, they see more clearly their own path. That's where leaders, that's what separates a, a level one and a level two um, and a level three pathfinder. So as we start, there's this huge link. Think of family members, think of children, think of people that you know, when they're grateful, you're going to almost do anything for them. But when there's not that gratitude, do you ever kind of say, well, gee, I keep giving and giving and giving. There's an emotional bank account there, as Stephen Covey taught in Seven Habits, 
sometimes it's overdrawn. When we come from a place of abundance and gratitude, if I have a grandchild or a child or a business associate, and I have several, I can't get ahead of. Every time I try to be way ahead, they come back with even more. And that's where you want to be when as a leader, you call someone, you don't want somebody to run from the phone. You want somebody to run to the phone, but we all have people, don't you? Do you ever have people that call you or text you and you see that come in? Beth is kind of, yeah, I, I know someone like that. And I don't want you to share the name, but we have people that are overdrawn in our emotional bank accounts. By the way, compliments are free. They're free. They don't cost a thing. When you are grateful, you become more generous and more affirming and edifying in your language with others. At a level one, that pathfinder that's trying to find their way, sometimes they want as much credit as they can get because they're taking care of things, they're handling things, they're starting, they want to be recognized. And there's a part of that that's okay. But you need to share credit and to be able to compliment and recognize what others are doing. That's the greatest gift as a true pathfinder. And so remember, compliments are free. I remember one of the first times I sat down with Stephen Covey after finishing the manuscript for Aspire. And he had gone through my book the night before we filmed. It was the last interview we had with him. We filmed him at his home. And he said, Kevin, I've read your book for a third time. This is going to impact people all over the world. Thank you for putting your best into this. Did he need to do that? No. Did John Maxwell, once he got my book, need to track me down and say, Kevin, I want you to know I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. Did he need to do that? No. But that's what a level three pathfinder does. They are looking for opportunities to recognize, acknowledge, affirm, edify, encourage, and ultimately inspire those that they lead. We're about 20 minutes in. We're about a third, a little over halfway, a third in here. Any thoughts or comments or questions? I'm going to start with Anna first, and then we'd love to hear from any of you, because this is about you, not about me today. Kevin, thank you. Uh, oh, there I am. So I took a few notes and I just thought were pretty impactful, like understanding the difference between a level one and a level three pathfinder. You just put it in such a simple term that level one, we're taking care of things. We're still in that management thinking and we're still trying to probably control a lot of things. But a level three pathfinder is someone who is much more focused on connecting and taking care of people and, and inspiring people um, because through people is where we see the greatest opportunity to make change and transform. So, you know, that is what I personally, what, you know, I try to get up and do every day. And, and look, sometimes it's a challenge, right? In my role, I have to focus a lot on operations as well. And it was a great reminder to make sure that the scales are tipping much more to the people and um, what we can do to light their path. So that's one thing I took away. Before we have someone else come in, I just want to unwrap what Anna just said a little bit. Sometimes as we begin this leadership journey, again, there's a lot of things in operation. There's a lot of things we could be, um, you know, be dealing with having, doing, getting, and at times it may even seem like, gee, people don't matter as much as things. And then in the middle at that level too, we said, well, yeah, I've still got to take care of things, but people do matter. And this is where a light turns on. At level three, it's, you know what, people really matter. People matter. Things don't matter so much. Yes, there's things that we need to get done. There are priorities. There are obviously important objectives, but people matter. Things don't is really what a level three 
leader starts to understand. And that's when a huge shift will take place. You've heard me say, Anna, that when it's time for my memorial service, and I'm going to be here for a while, I'm not going anywhere any too soon. Um, I've asked, I don't want pockets in my clothes because you can't take anything with you. You have that said that. New, what's that? You have said that many times. <laughs> that, and that isn't new to any of you, but it's so important to, as you start to leave a legacy, Mm -hmm. People know that they're important. The only thing you're going to be able to take with me, at least I believe, is what I've learned, the knowledge that I've learned, and the relationships that I've made. That's it. That is it. I mean, I can leave a, a nice endowment for grandkids. We can have something for college educations. Of course, those are important. We'll do that. But the only thing that really matters at the end of the day, if you ask people, who deal with people at the end of their life, the number one focus is relationships. The number one regret is, did I mend those relationships? Did I keep those relationships strong? Did I say, I love you, I forgive you, I, I believe in you just one more time? Mm -hmm. That's critical. Um, and, and, you know, I think that, we would all agree, especially in this group, that we we understand that at such a deep level. I think the challenge is, are we asking ourselves all the right questions, right? Because we can we can be we can default into thinking about the things and thinking about the tasks, and especially I think for you know a lot of the the realtors who are on this call, the agents who are on this call, right, making sure that they're they're checking off boxes and dotting I's and crossing T's around moving the transaction forward for their client. But at the end of the day, it's always about the, the people. And I know in a, in a, in our hearts, we know that to be true. But we just it's about balancing and keeping that focus in front of us. And I love when you asked um, you know or put the question out to us about you know how can we add value or who can we add value to today not what but who who can we add value to today so i wrote that down but i'd love to hear some thoughts from other people on the call um any ahas so far or questions for kevin what resonated with you um hello kevin it's always such an amazing gift to hear you speak you 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 glow from within and thank you so much for everything that you share with us you're fantastic and uh i really appreciate it um so when you said compliments are free i remembered this book i read many many years ago the power of acknowledgement mm. and just you know you acknowledge someone for something that they do and it's like a silly little story there was a kid in the grocery store at the uh deli counter and i said well i'm going to test this theory so i let somebody else go ahead of me and i got him to slice my cold cuts and i told him i waited for you because i love the way you do wow. you like you slice your cold cuts and it's fantastic well you would have thought i wrote the guy a check for a million dollars and every time i would go to the grocery store after i would see him i <laughs> I could be on the other side of the store and he would scream at me and say, how are you, my friend? And, you know, whatever. And it was a little silly, you know, just a small thing. And it made such a difference to him. And, you know, we don't know what's going on with people. So you think you're just doing not a big deal. And it makes, obviously, it made a huge impact on him. So I agree with you. Compliments are free and they make people feel good. Wow. I, I hope I saw Aaron's got a comment or I saw her hand move. Maybe she was bidding for something that her auction. She, no, I was just wiping my, I was just moving my hand, but let's talk about what Liz just said. Um, number one, sometimes we think people don't need compliments. Oh, they're at the top of the game. Every day's a good day. Um, Liz started by giving me a compliment. And we receive compliments. And sometimes instead of actually acknowledging, use the word acknowledge, Liz, even when someone 
gives us a compliment, we can chase gratitude and abundance away. We say, oh, that's nothing. Oh, what I did was nothing. And so what I said silently when Liz said that to me, and I ask people to do that, and I'd ask you to consider doing this, you can even say it out loud for a while till it becomes habit. Thank you, Liz. I accept and receive the words that you just shared with immense gratitude. That isn't arrogant. That isn't self-centered. That is acknowledging the abundance and the gratefulness and the generosity that is flowing your way. And isn't that interesting? I, I waited for you. I came here because of you. See, that is so huge. I just left this morning a market after you and I talked, Anna, this morning. And um, my wife has been on a health um, journey and her health is, is starting to return. It's a miracle that we're very, very grateful for. You'll probably get to see her next time, Anna, when you're out. You didn't get to this year, but it's all a work in progress. And there is a woman that manages the floral part of a very high-end grocery store called Harmon's. And I went in one day and I, I, I said, I, I need something special for my wife. This is a few years ago. And I mean, she took care of me. She, she gave me everything that I needed. I actually carried it out to my car to make sure it wasn't damaged, put it in a container so I could bring it back. Her name is Suzette. When I go to that store, I'll say, how are you, Suzette? And, if, and after a few times, I came back and gave her a signed copy of Aspire. And I just said, you are so good. She does flowers as well as anyone that I've ever seen. I watched her this morning after I walked in, just, just giving flowers some love. That's why I loved to see Susan, those, again, those sunflowers, that was kind of on my mind this morning after seeing Suzette, but just a word of encouragement. Remember, spire, people say it means spirit, it means breath. If you go back in 12 different languages, spire means breath, so to inspire is to breathe life into somebody. Hey, I waited for you. The way you take care of this at the deli, I mean, that is important work. And for you to recognize that, Liz, encourage, C-O-U-R, means heart in the romantic languages. So when I encourage, I add to somebody's heart. So it's nice to start looking at people as a heart or a set of lungs and say, how can I breathe life into them or their dream? It doesn't cost anything to call somebody by name, to recognize them for doing a job well done, to write a note if you're traveling and you stay in a hotel and leave a note for the housekeeper and say, thank you. Thank you for taking care of my room and just leaving a little note of gratitude. Um, that's, that's huge. When we would hire someone at Franklin, we're going to come back here. At, there's a couple of other minds that booted up. When we would hire someone at Franklin for an executive sales job, one of the final things that we did is we would take them to dinner with a friend, their significant other, their spouse. Uh, they, they, generally, they would bring someone with them. And it might come down to two or three candidates. And we'd have several, two or three interviews to get to this point. This might've been the fourth experience. I wanted to see, I, I was privileged to, to lead out the sales and training side of Franklin um, Quest, which ev eventually became Franklin Covey. Um, I wanted to know how they would treat the server. Again, here I am versus there you are. And there were a lot of hires that, that weren't made because they would treat that server like they were a lesser person. And, and that's something to remember. If you ever feel like you're superior to someone in a certain setting, you'll likely feel inferior to somebody else in a different setting. And we're all the same. We're all the same. No one is any more or any less. And that's what you see 
in a level three producer, a level three pathfinder, that they understand that very, very clearly. Anna, let's do a couple more comments and, and questions because, um, you know, you see these come in. Beth is, is putting her hand up by her face. Something just booted up. She was going like this, scratching her head. Beth, since you moved your hands, what, what are you thinking this morning? So I appreciate you as well. And I always, always get something out of what you share, but and I have quite a few notes, but um, a couple of things that you said, um, you know, as you light the path for others, your path becomes clearer. So you, the intention is not to light my own path, but as you lead people and you're, and you're leading them, your path becomes clearer. Um, mm -hmm. I really like that. And um, also you said, do you understand your gifts? So I'm kind of a late bloomer at 61 and getting a handle on this life stuff. So, you know, I don't even know that I knew what my gifts were a while ago, you know, not, you know, and so, so do I understand them? I, I mean, I use them. I see that I use them, but do I really understand them? I really, so you've just given me something to think about there and thank you. Thank you, Beth. Can I comment on that, Anna, for just a second? Yes, please. Um, you're just a puppy, Beth, 61. You're, you're barely starting chapter two, okay? You got so much ahead. I mean, it might not be- You just made a lot of people on this call very happy. Well, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little further down the road than you are, Beth. And in my view, I'm in chapter two. Now, it may not be a 35 page or chapter book. It might be a shorter book, but no, I'm there's so much ahead. And remember- that when we say to ourselves, oh, or someone says to you, Beth, you're a natural at that. This seems to come naturally to you. And you say, I would do this for free. Those are little hints that those are gifts. I love to coach. I love to speak. I love to write. I love to connect. That Those are that's what I just love to do. So when we get to that level three, something clicks in where we say, you know, I think I'm going to do more of what I love. What's wrong with that? Do more of what you love with those you love and surround yourself with people that care about you and that really, truly love you. That's where it should. By the way, with the top agents here, I it's so... Um, th these principles apply whether we're talking about pathfinding and we're all leaders. You're being a pathfinder for someone who's acquiring a, a home. You know, if it's a residential home, some of you might be in commercial, but if it's a residential opportunity, that is one of the most sacred things that you could ever do is help someone get into that place where they can have solitude and peace and feel like home. It's the difference, both as a pathfinder and as a producer, of I'm, am I thinking short-term, transaction, thing, get this done, or am I thinking long-term, relationship? Do I want to open a relationship or do I want to close a transaction? Is this something that we can do? How can I help this person get, not what I want, We've all been around somebody here's and they, they want what they want. And that, you know, that that becomes pretty clear really quick. But when you are someone who's known for helping someone get what they want, we receive what we desire for others. You want somebody to get what they want? You're going to get a lot more of what you want. It's the law of reciprocity. When we do something for someone else without expecting anything in return. And by the way, I've coached some of the top salespeople in the world. They are interpersonally astute. They actually care. They really care about others. And they view others as a heart and a set of lungs. And they say, how can I breathe life into someone today? Who can I add to their heart? Who can I encourage? Who can I edify? Who can I compliment? A couple of other 
thoughts? Yeah, I just I want to just jump in quick and then definitely share, uh, have others share. So this morning, every Monday morning, uh, you all know I lead Monday Morning Mojo. Join the group and join my Zoom every Monday at 7.30 a.m. I shared this morning that if you want to elevate your level of success, if you want to earn more money, find a way to be of more value to more people. And so, you know, that is in alignment with what you're saying here today, Kevin. So that's the universe speaking again, uh, that, you know, if we want to grow and if we want to have opportunities for ourselves, and like I said, earn more money and, and, and you know, really become more and more successful, then we have to ask ourselves every day, who can we add value to and how can I show up and create opportunity for other people? Um, and I think that's what you mean when you say light the path of others, right? Because then our path becomes very clear. So who else has something that they'd like to share or ask? I want to give you an opportunity to talk to Kevin today. I'll share. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can't find the raise my hand thing. How long have we been using Zoom? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no worries. I think by now. Too. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. I first, I just want to start by thanking Anna for your leadership and opening oh, us up to opportunities like this with Kevin. So um, it's funny. I was reading last week about the more books you read, you start to see, you start to hear maybe the same message in different lights. And um, Kevin, we're, most of us I think here are in a book club right now called The Happiness Advantage. And you focus so much on gratitude that I think one of the things we know and the more I come think am gracious for things in my life, um, the happier I become, which is helping me lead to more success. But what I'm realizing is the happier I become Yes, it leads to my success, but more importantly, I'm finding it leads to other people's success. Wow. So that's one of my biggest takeaways. Gretchen, I am so glad that you shared, and by the way, wonderful book, The Happiness Advantage and the principles that come out of starting with gratitude. Just think about this for a second. If we only receive today, I'm a person of belief, so if we only receive today what we thank God for yesterday, what would we receive today? That's a pretty sobering thought. Um, just a powerful thought, Gretchen, that the happier you are. I mean, when we, we don't see the world as it is. Um, I've, I've coached a handful of world-class athletes that have gone to stand on the top podiums of the world, gold medalists, world champion You're athletes, the mental side. And I remember asking one in one of our mastermind experience, someone asked John Vandergeist, and he was the captain of the U.S. rugby team. <clears throat> and they said, John, if you lived in a perfect world, and he stopped, and he said, I live in a perfect world. That's the only world that I choose to live in. So being happy is a choice. Growing is a choice. Expressing gratitude is a choice. It's a huge choice. And just being present for others. I was, we watched a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to, Anna, can I give everybody an assignment to watch a movie? I don't know that I can give you an assignment to watch a movie. Yeah, you can do anything you want. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe not anything. But if you haven't watched A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, or if you have, watch it again. Deb is kind of nodding her head. Um, my, my editor at HarperCollins, two of her favorite books, and I'm grateful she mentioned mine, that she ever worked on was Aspire, and then the book by Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers' book. And I remember asking her, what is he like? And she said, oh, Kevin, he's so much better than you'll ever be able to comprehend, you know, comprehend until you're in his presence. That, that ability to listen, to one of Stephen Covey's most often quoted of the seven habits is seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. Well, 
you got to be a, a level three pathfinder to even want to understand and to listen because now you've moved from things all these things that matter well no here's here's something that really matters here's someone let's talk and and just listen to them and be present and i don't know deb if you can remember the scene he there if you haven't watched the movie there's a writer who's an award-winning writer, but nobody will talk to him anymore because he doesn't see the world perfectly. He's very critical of everyone he writes about. He likes to find the imperfection in others. We're all perfectly imperfect. It's really easy. If you want to look for flaws, you're going to find them. And pretty soon, the only person that would agree to an interview with him was Mr. Rogers. And his boss says, Lloyd, you got to do this one right. Get out and get it done. And he spends a lot of time getting to know Mr. Rogers because Mr. Rogers got to know him. And one day he asked him what his wife was named, what, it, what his wife's name was. And I remember the scene. If you can remember it, Deb, did you, have you watched that, Deb? Have you watched A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood or are you just a fan of Mr. Rogers? Well, I'm a fan of Mr. Rogers, but I, there's two. There's a documentary and then there's I think the movie, and I think yes. what I watched was the documentary about him, and I think I still need to see the movie, so I'm not sure I know this piece of it, but the documentary was phenomenal. Yeah, you, you can never go wrong by watching a documentary of a real person, and there's a moment in the documentary, and that's not what I was referring to, but where he's receiving a PBS Lifetime Achievement Award, and do you know what he did? He said, let's all just pause here for a minute and be silent and express gratitude to others for all they've done for us. He did this while receiving an award. You try that for a minute on an award show. Well, in the movie, he calls Lloyd early one morning and it doesn't say what time, but it could have been six, seven o'clock. Lloyd is in bed with his wife, his wife's name. I, I may have forgotten her name. I, I think it's Elizabeth, but he calls and Elizabeth answers. And she picks up the phone. That's why it's so important to listen to names, to write them down, to care about them. Your server, if they don't have a name tag, what's your name? Where are you from? Just get to know them. He calls in the morning, and this was based on a true story. And she answers, and he says, hi, is this Elizabeth? This is Mr. Rogers. And she holds the phone and she turns to Lloyd, who's starting to have this arc of his character starting to change by being influenced by Mr. Rogers. She says, it's Mr. Rogers. And he knows my name. That was one of the most powerful things I've ever, he knows my name. Think of what you've heard this morning as we have, we've been on this call together. He knows my name. Oh, Liz, I waited for you. They know who you are. She then went, she said, well, here, let me, let me hand the phone to Lloyd. And Mr. Rogers says again, not so hurt. Don't get in a hurry here, Elizabeth. Can I just express my gratitude for you? And I'm not quoting this word for word. But he said, you know, Lloyd travels all over the world and he's writing about famous people. I just wanted to acknowledge, just like Liz did at the deli, I just wanted to acknowledge you, Elizabeth, for sharing Lloyd with me so that he can do. And she's like, she, you know, covers the phone again. He's thanking me, Lloyd. He's thanking me. To, and he was according to my editor, Mary Ellen at HarperCollins, he was all that and more. I can't talk as slowly as Tom Hanks, who played <laughs> Mr. Rogers. We tried that at a family dinner over President's Day weekend to say, okay, let's see if we can talk as slowly and as carefully. And let's, let's see if we can do a minute here over a meal and at a restaurant. I couldn't last 30 seconds. I know I couldn't. <laughs> So just to express the gratitude that Gretchen talked about, it brings us happiness and it is a choice. Yeah. Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning wrote these words and boy, did he know 
what he was writing about. Everything can be taken from a man, but the last of the human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, the ability to choose one's own way. Now, I'll tell you, if there's a book to read to change your outlook on life, that would be one of them. It's Victor Frankl's, yeah. Of the search. hundreds of books, and I've read, of the books that I've read, that's got to be top 100, top 25, probably of all books that I've ever read. Sure, I agree. Um, so, Kevin, you, we still have a few minutes with you. Um, what what can you um, share with us? You 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 touched on something very briefly in the beginning uh, of our time together, and that was a champion's mindset. And um, yes, I have had the pleasure of hearing um, Peter speak, Peter Vidmar, um, and I think that's what has inspired that um, that analogy for you. So, what are some key characteristics of a champion's mindset? Because I think as leaders, we also have to be focused on winning, right? And, and what that means is that we show up and we, we play to win, not just to participate. So what can you share with us about a champion's mindset? And you know what, this would be fun to do for a full hour at some point. I know, I know. I'm asking you to do it in a few minutes. We'll do it, but... we'll do it quickly. Um, we're actually working on a book called The Choices of a Champion. And there is a champion's mindset. One, they're very clear about where they're, they're going. Visualization is critical. The mind never thinks, Aristotle said, without a picture. So when we have a picture, you heard Yoda, the Greek artist, one of the great artists um, of our day, talk about having an image. Stephen Covey said to begin with the end in mind. You, I mean, you wouldn't start out on a journey if you didn't know where you're going. And he also said the best way to live the ideal future is to create it. So Things are created spiritually, mentally, physically before they're manifested physically, always. And so you want to get very clear. Clarity is the road taught it empowers. So get a vision and get as crystal clear about that vision as you can. Two, you then emotionalize that vision. And it isn't just um, what will it look like? You heard Peter say, because he, he was the captain of the U.S. gymnastics team, and for 12 and a half years, he kept saying, what will it feel like? We started this today by saying, bring, recruit. We, you're going after a big goal, big dream, big intention. The more senses that you can get involved. So the ability to emotionalize that. And he said he visualized for 12 and a half years doing a six hour workout plus 15 minutes. He couldn't work out twice as long as anyone else. He's one of my best friends, just came through, took Sherry. I had some, um, some commitments, but he and his wife, Donna, just took Sherry to lunch here just a couple of weeks ago. He was the captain of the 84 U.S. Olympic team, and it was emotionalizing. What will it feel like for me, my family, everything I'm sacrificing? Three, champions are consistent and persistent. It's doing things consistently. And, and Anna, at some point, let's do this invest formula that we've been working on. I sent that to you. We worked on it at our mastermind at Zion Park just last weekend. And that's come a long ways to just be able to be consistent and doing certain things every single day in a sustainable, abundant way. It isn't the one hit wonder that's the great leader or the great producer. It's saying, I know that if I do this, if I plant these seeds consistently, I'm gonna have a harvest and it's gonna be an abundant harvest. All the great athletes that I've worked in, all the great CEOs and leaders that I've worked with, all the great sales professionals that I've had a chance to coach or work with, they understand what they need to be consistent and persistent about. And they might do just a little bit more. Peter said every other athlete might be in the gym for five and a half, six hours. I'm going to do one last routine, one last workout that's 15 minutes. And I'm going to visualize and emotionalize 
that I'm at the Olympic Games and that we are the last two gymnasts, he and his best friend, Tim Daggett, and we're head to head with the People's Republic of China. Guess what? He was visualizing that years before he ever made the team. And in 1984, he and his best friend were the last two gymnasts up for the United States. He was the captain of the team and they were neck to neck with the People's Republic of China. That visualization, when you start to emotionalize it, is a powerful thing. And then they were consistent and persistent. And the last thing I would share is that specificity, be specific. And by the way, when you're going after something as a producer, I'd like to do this or more. It's always good to add more. Don't limit what you can do. Thomas Edison said, if we did all the things that we're capable of doing, we'd literally astound ourselves. I want to produce this much. I want to sell this much. I want to serve this much. I want to lead in this way or more. Never, ever cap the abundance that can flow to you and through you to others. By the way, that's what a level three producer and pathfinder does. They visualize abundance flowing to them and through them to others. And they're very specific about what that looks like. Anna, you heard in the second retreat, you were at the second retreat, correct? Yes, I was. Because um, I actually stepped out of my own retreat for a day and a half because of uh, my wife's some health issues. We found out that when I'm not at my own retreat, it goes better <laughs> without me. Because my team- No, we missed you home. and we missed you. And it was a great testimony to your leadership and your ability to light the path of other people because you had people who could step in and create this profound experience for everyone because you laid the groundwork for it. And I thought, you know, how beautiful you teach us about legacy and you didn't expect that to happen yet. You gave us this lesson in action around so many things that you teach us. And so to me, that was a great, a great testimony to your legacy. Thank you, Anna. It was so rewarding to watch my team just step up, you know, it was, and I'm watching things from zoom for, Friday when you're in Zion Park and then Saturday until I was able to join for that last hour and a half, two hours to be able to come back and finish it off. Um, you heard, and I've met uh, him and visit with him, the story of one of Peter's other dear friends, John Neighbor. John Neighbor is, is a world champion athlete. Um, he competed in the 200 meter uh, free stroke and that is a sub 60 second event so if you're at the olympic games you're at the summer games and you're watching that event if you go to get popcorn you're going to miss the event because it's, <laughs> it's over done that quick he he had set an intention and he got really specific so you heard this and peter didn't share that at the first retreat it was powerful the john was swimming at about 59 and a half seconds. And the world record was 55.55. 55.5 seconds and change by Roland Mathis, a German swimmer who John became, you know, a rival with, they actually became good friends. And he said, look, I got four years. I don't think I can knock four seconds up in one year, but if I'm specific and consistent, he had this vision, everything we're talking about here, he emotionalized it. And then he set a goal, 55.5. If I can swim 55.5, there's a chance that I can be the gold medal winner at the summer games. And so every year he was persistent, consistent. He was knocking off a second per year. And by the way, Anna, if he, trim, I need to trim my fingernails. I was looking at, I've got to trim them just a little bit this morning. If he had trimmed his fingernails that day, what I'm about to share likely didn't happen because that's how close the finish was. He won by a fingernail against Roland Mathis. That record had lasted for seven years. Up to that point, that was the longest sprint 200 meters is, is the longest sprint distance. It's a, just a little bit, almost in the middle distance. But seven and a half years, Roland Mathis 
was undefeated. Nobody had even come close to him. And John Neighbor, one of Peter's best friends. He's a, a doppelganger. Is that, do I say that right? Yeah, um, doppelganger, yep. I sometimes say doppelbanger and my kids are like, don't, you just don't. Don't say that. <laughs> doppelganger and he was John Cleese from Monty Python. That's John Neighbor. He is funny. He looks like <laughs> him, he talks like him. He touches the finish. And he he is, by the way, um, and I've been to a couple of Olympic games. I've worked with athletes there. It happens almost immediate. In particular, at a swimming event, they come out of the pool. Peter described him getting a gold medal put around his neck and looking you know, at the, at the silver medalist and the bronze medalist. John Neighbor, who had written 55.5 on his mirror, in his car, on his dashboard, in his office, in his workout bag, in his locker, it was everywhere for four years. They're putting the gold medal around his neck with drops pinging. You heard Peter describe that pinging off of his wet hair. And he looks up to the right and he sees OR, that's Olympic record, WR, world record. And then below that, 55 point. Can you remember, Anna? Four, nine. 55.49. When we deal in specifics, we rarely fail. When we deal in, in generalities, we rarely succeed. So that champion's mindset is create that vision. Be very clear about what you want. Then emotionalize that vision, step two. Then be persistent and consistent and do just a little bit more just a little bit more. People say I give 110%. You can't give more than 100%. Right. Just do just a little bit more and then be specific with what you want. And yeah, John, sure. John definitely had the mindset of a champion. He won that Olympic game so many times in his head and he felt that joy, none of which was probably could compare to how it felt when he actually did it. Yet it was that movie that just played over and over again. So, you know, what are you pursuing now? What is the goal that you're seeing? And are you playing that movie over and over again? I think that's what Kevin would want you to ask yourself. You know, what is the movie you're playing over and over again? Do you need to change the channel? <laughs> because that movie should be should be so inspiring and, and you should feel it. I know I, I see Lori put in the chat that her aha today was clarity results from both visualizing and emotionalizing your path. So it's about going after your goals with all five of your senses, right? Taste it, touch it, feel it. You know that saying, I wanted it so bad I could taste it. That's that's what we're talking about. Absolutely. And you know what, Anna, it is always a privilege um, my uh, my assistant Chantel's been on the call today, and she said, "Boy, these you can feel the phenomenal energy from this group." And uh, um, like I said to you this morning, there might still be a chance to have one or two additional people for each retreat next year. So, Anna, there's somebody here you think would be wonderful to join us next year. You're invited. You are invited. It's an invitation only event, and if you're on Anna's team. Um, we would love to have you um, to join us. And I just want to thank you again. Liz is saying thank you um, to the chat thread. It is always a privilege and a pleasure, Anna, to be with you. I, I think the world of Anna Gids, um, that's why I'm here today. As a leader, you get it. As someone who has ideas that come from the heart and the mind, and uh, I count you as a dear friend and just grateful for this opportunity to be to be with you today. And if any of you need me, my email is kevin at powerofwords.com. You can email me if you need anything. You got a question, email me, kevin at powerofwords.com. Um, anything else, Anna, before we wrap up? 
No, other than I thank you. And I hear and receive what you just said to me with immense gratitude. So thank you, Kevin, for being a pathfinder on my path and lighting that path. I thank all of you for joining us. We'll see you back here on April 4th for our next Leadership Academy call. And um, you'll definitely be seeing more of Kevin Hall. I promise I'll bring him back around. So thank you so much, Kevin. Have a wonderful day. Love you. Thank, thank you. you. My privilege and honor. Love you, Anna. And grateful to be here with each of you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Care.